So today our speaker is Professor Kent Peacock, and he will be speaking on COP and climate change. Please welcome Professor Peacock. Thank you very much to SACPA for inviting me, and, and thanks to everybody for coming out today on what's actually turned out to be a pretty cold day. And of course, there's something funny about giving a talk about global warming, warming yeah. when it's minus 27. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, let's not forget that it, it's cold this week, but this has been an uncharacteristically warm uh, winter. Like, this, today is more like normal Jan uh, February weather for Lethbridge, right? And, and uh, it's been... I mean, up, up well above zero for you know many days throughout January. But anyway, um, <laughs> moving on, I, I just wanted to mention that it's a, I checked my calendar. It's actually been almost exactly 24 years ago that I, I, I had the privilege of giving a talk, almost to this very day, to talk to this group. With, and the title of my talk was, Is It Utterly Hopeless to Do Anything About the Environment? And um, <laughs> We were all much younger then, eh? so, um, and perhaps uh, what I said then was a bit more hopeful than what I have to say today, and perhaps a little, I'm going to say today is a little bit less visionary and, and more practical and urgent than what I said then. Now, I'm not going to embarrass anybody by asking if there's anybody else here who was present at that talk back in, anyway, so, so um, maybe that could be down just a bit. How's that? Everybody here? Here's Okay, so. Okay, so um, bad pun in, in, the, in the title, uh, but, but um, we all need a bit of a laugh. Uh, unfortunately, most of what I'm going to talk about is pretty grim. And uh, um, so I think I should just say at the outset, I'm, I'm not what's called a climate doomer. There are, there are people who uh, will tell you that, oh, it's all over, it's too late, we're all going to be dead in, pick your favorite term, five years ago two years or something. I don't agree with that view, and I think it's actually a potentially uh, harmful view, but, but uh, it's, uh, there, are, there are very re serious reasons to be deeply concerned about where we are around climate, and I, I think any, any effective action that we take has to be built on a very clear-eyed recognition of how serious the problem really is, which is actually more serious, I think, than most people realize. So uh, Mark Gettle asked me to provide a, an update on COP27 and, and, and sort of where the world stands today in terms of our response to climate. And uh, I don't have time to discuss all of the major risks associated with humanity's current attempt to dump all of the carbon the biosphere has accumulated in the past 350 million years into the atmosphere as quickly as possible. But I want to highlight a couple of main concerns, especially around sea level rise, because it's a problem that doesn't get the attention it deserves. Um, and what we'll see is that, okay, there's a level of the science that most competent climate scientists, earth scientists broadly agree on, and then there are some critical issues that are still matters of scientific uncertainty, it's to some extent even debate, and uh, we want the sort of climate elephants in the room, and we want to sort of be aware of some of those questions as well. And, um, okay, so um, let's get started here. So, oh, it worked, that's great. So just my, my abstract, which was published. So I wanted to start off with this quote, which I, quote that I particularly like from a, a, a glaciologist named Henry Pollock. And I don't know much about Henry Pollock, except that he was a glaciologist and was a, one of the authors on a, some of the IPCC reports. He wrote a very good book back in 2009 called The World Without Ice, in which he said, nature's best thermometer, perhaps its most sensitive and unambiguous indicator of climate change is ice. When ice gets sufficiently warm, it melts. Ice asks no questions, presents no arguments, reads no newspapers, listens to no debates. It is not burdened by ideology and carries no political baggage as it crosses the threshold from solid to liquid. It just melts. Right, and um, so in part you can take this as sort of a friendly warning about the concerns ar ar around ice melt and sea level rise, uh, and, but also it's a, for me as a philosopher, as I said, this is good philosophy coming from a glaciologist. It it um, it tells us that it's, please don't forget we're not alone in this world. It's not just a human world. 
there are glaciers and ice sheets and whales and, and rainforests and other things that we, we barely even begin to understand, which have been here a lot longer than we have. And in a certain sense, you know, speaking metaphorically, but in a certain sense, they have their own agenda. And um, if we want to fulfill some of our agendas, we should be aware of theirs. So anyway, so that's kind of the, the background. It's where this is all going. But anyway, uh, Mark asked me to talk about COP. And so here's just a quick primer on what I'm just calling the alphabet soup of, I mean, when you study climate change policy these days, there's just a, a myriad of acronyms you have to become familiar with. And here's some of the ones that a lot of you will already know most what these mean, but just for the record. So this thing called UNEP, the United Nations Environment Program. Um, there's a WMO, World Meteorological Organization. There's a group called the IPC, IPPC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which was founded by UNEP and WMO back in 1988. I'm going to talk a little bit about how IPCC works, because uh, that's very important in current policy discussions. And then there's another organization called the UNFCCC. I mean, why couldn't they keep it simple? Anyway, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And then the COP conference is finally that I was asked to talk about what it means is COP means Conference of the Parties to the UNFCCC. So these are the hundred and something nations who back in the 1990s signed this international convention that yes, we'll get together and talk about climate change and, and agree to finally someday uh, do, do something about it. So, and there's been a number of COPs, so we're up to COP, the latest one was COP27, which was held last November in, in Egypt. Um, the, the, another notable one was COP, I forget the COP number, 15 or something, but it was it held in, in uh, Paris, of course, in 2015, and that forged a major agreement on climate, which a lot of people, I mean, it's a great moment of optimism and ter terrific photo op for everybody, and everybody thought that, well, has, you know, Hasn't the Paris Agreement just solved our problem? But no, not at all. So that's one of the things I want to talk about. So <clears throat> briefly, how the IPCC works. So it, it's a, this group publishes a major assessment reports every six to seven years. The latest is AR6, published in uh, uh, late 21 and early 22. <coughs> um, the, there's a special report in 2018, which also is widely cited. Now, how does the IPCC work? So I don't know all the bureaucratic details, and I don't want to, but the, the, gist, the gist of the IPCC is that it's divided into so-called working groups, which are staffed by scientists, so actual, for real, PhD scientists, climatologists, glaciologists, biologists, whatever, many, many uh, specialists work together, I mean, essentially on a volunteer basis, as far as I understand, and, and what they do is they synthesize the results of hundreds of, of, of peer-reviewed papers, uh, the most recent literature. So they try and create a synthesis of, okay, glaciology. Well, what is the status of thinking on glaciology? And it's very important to realize the IPCC predictions are very well founded in, in refereed science. Uh, doesn't mean that they're perfect or infallible, and I'll talk about that, but they're not speculative or alarmist. All right, so there is a sort of a narrative that the IPCC is a cabal of left-wing scientists out to impose socialism on the world or something like that. No, it's just a bunch of people trying to get it right, trying to get a very hard subject right as best they can. They're trying very hard to be unbiased and accurate. But there are some problems with the IPCC. So one simple technical problem is not always up to date because there's a process, like there's a deadline to submit research papers to the IPCC. And then they have to, it, it takes weeks to, or months to, for them to have their meetings and process all the information. So sometimes by the time the, it, it translates into um, uh, what's called the executive summaries, the rec recommendations for policymakers, um, sometimes it can be months or even a couple of years. So, so it, sometimes they're a little out of date. More important though, um, the, the IPCC projections tend to be conservative, and there's two reasons for that. One is that scientists themselves are cautious and do not want to say anything that cannot be supported. Uh, in science, it's very easy to be wrong, very hard to be right. Scientists know this. 
Uh, scientists, there's a phrase due to Naomi Oreskes, scientists like to err on the side of least drama, right? So, so if, you, if you privately think that we're going to get two meters of sea level rise, you might say, well, I'm going to publicly say we're going to get one meter of sea level rise because at least if I'm wrong, I won't look like a fool. Or at least that's what they think. Um, plus, it's, there's just, it's just difficult. It's just scientifically difficult to make these predictions with any degree of confidence. The other problem with the IPCC is the report. Now, the, the, the work, the reports are produced by scientists, but what ultimately makes it to the street or to onto the prime minister's desk or something is it has to, they have to be vetted politically. And that is especially anything to do with recommendations. And most governments, uh, especially from the oil producing countries, want to minimize the urgency of climate risks. Now this is partially just because we depend so much on oil, partially because got some government officials are basically lobbyists with oil companies in disguise, partially because um, um, governments in general just don't like bad news. So, so um, there's, a, there's a phrase NIMTO, which means not in my term of office, right? And they sort of like NIMTO, right? And, they, and they, they just, they don't want bad news. They want business as usual until the next election. And, and a, bunch of, uh, a bunch of scientists with pocket protectors and slide rules in their pocket come along and tell them that, you know, Houston, we have a problem, and they, they, they don't want to hear that. So it's, it's not the case that the IPCC's reports are wildly alarmist. They're actually cautious and conservative. The, the truth could be worse. And in particular, with respect to sea level rise, which I'm going to talk about. So what has been agreed upon in these various agreements most of you again will know this. It is agreed that temperature increase must be held to well below 2 degrees C above pre industrial levels, which are defined as 1850 to 1900. And that's a problem right there because, it, you know, uh, carbon burning industry actually started in more like 1750, but they choose to make it 1850 to 1900. And aspirationally, whatever that means, to no more than 1.5 C. And the math, they've done the math to meet the 1.5 degree target with a 66% chance, so-called one sigma chance, emissions must be reduced by at least 45 to 50% by 2030. Do you see that happening? And then there's a thing called the carbon budget, uh, which is supposedly the amount of carbon dioxide that we can still emit to have a 66% percent chance of meeting the climate targets. And to meet um, 20, the 1.5, the, the latest estimate, which was just published a, um, a few months ago, we can emit no more than 260 gigatons of CO2 from the start of 2023 onwards. So that was published just a few weeks ago. Now there are things called NDCs, nationally determined contributions. So, so um, this, these were set up during the Paris Agreement in 2015 and they've been slightly uh, strengthened since then in some of the other meetings. This is essentially uh, every nation has agreed or promised to its own voluntary emissions targets. And they're not all using the same metric or they're not all the same, but um, anyway, that, that's, that's how it works. And then uh, people now talk of the goal of reaching net zero by 2050. So um, uh, Canada, for example, has uh, about 120 countries have promised to have net zero emissions by 2050. So net zero obviously doesn't mean you're going to have zero emissions. It means that somehow you're going to offset the emissions you create by some means of removing carbon from the system. With that left a little bit unclear as to how it's going to work. And they've also made agreements so to provide funding for the less developed countries to assist the transition to a lower carbon future. And also, in most recent uh, COP, there's a, there's a fund going to, supposedly going to be set up to compensate for what's called loss and damage. So the countries that have benefited from uh, burning fossil fuels are going to help defray some of the costs uh, suffered by countries like, for recently, Pakistan, uh, which uh, are suffering some of the effects of climate change that we supposedly caused. Okay, so <clears throat> some progress has been made, but is this good enough? One of the, the big problems with all these agreements, starting with Paris 2015, they're entirely <coughs> promissory. 
or James Hansen used the word precatory, which is kind of a nasty way of saying promissory. There are no consequences whatsoever for any parties to the agreement who fail to meet their promised emission reductions or financial contributions. It's just a promise, right? It also relies largely on self-reporting. So, so, um, and uh, Mark Gettle sent me recently sent me a report that Chris Spearman sent him, showing that methane emissions in Western Canada are grossly underreported. Just as a small example, because you rely on the people who produce the emissions to report the emissions. And uh, anyway, so. There's a report published last fall called the United Nations UNEP Emissions Gap Report, uh, talking about the gap between what we're actually doing and what we, uh, the science says we need to do. And so the current NDCs, if all those promises were fulfilled, and at best it's going to give us 2.4 to 2.6 degrees C increase, maybe more. Nowhere near two, let alone 1.5. And the UNEP report says, quote, there is no credible pathway to 1.5 C in place. It just did this. It's just nothing. And presumably we have about six and a half years to, to do something that we're not even starting to do. So what's actually happening? So in actual fact, everybody will know, oil producing jurisdictions are ramping up their oil production as fast as they can. Uh, major oil companies have made colossal profits in the last year or so, partially triggered by the Ukraine war. And um, I've, there's an article in The Guardian recently, uh, if, what they've done is they've gone through and enumerated all the planned oil projects that are in process. And they've classified 195 of them as carbon bombs, which are projects that would each result in at least a billion tons of CO2 emissions. And it, which in total is equivalent to about 18 years of current global CO2 emissions. And this is planned. This is ongoing and planned further development of fossil fuels. Coal use is increasing in a number of countries. Pakistan, for example, is building more coal-fired electric generation stations because they can't get natural gas. They can afford. They don't have any other options. They, they need the electricity immediately. So what, what do they do? They build coal-fired stations. So what's actually going on in the world, the way I think about it, governments are pretending to be designing their climate and energy policies on the basis of a sober cost-benefit analysis. In fact, what they're doing is practicing what I sometimes call climate brinkmanship, analogous to nuclear brinkmanship. Push it as close to the edge as possible. And but instead of new nations facing off against each other, which is what happens in nuclear brinkmanship, we're facing off against the Thwaites Glacier, which may not be interested in playing our game. So, now there's a bunch of wild cards, and I haven't got time to talk about all of these in the detail they deserve, but I just want to make sure that everybody's aware of some of the, um, what I mean by a wild card here is, these are the things that even the, top, the, the, the scientists themselves are still not sure about. They're not either because of scientific uncertainties or sometimes even philosophical debates, issue, debates in principle, but mostly scientific uncertainties. And um, so one I'm particularly going to mention, how quickly can sea level rise occur? Uh, another major uncertainty, which I don't have time to cover, and it's extremely important, breakdown of permafrost in the Arctic both on land and on continental shelves. Deeply, deeply important. Um, it's still a work in progress to understand this. There's also something called global dimming or aerosol masking, which most people haven't heard of, and I would briefly mention that. And then the, the broader question of is net zero good enough? And then there's a question of cascading tipping points. So a tipping point is a point um, at which a system accelerates suddenly due to positive feedback, it accelerates and out of any possible control and moves to a new regime. And that I, I illustrate this with my students by very slowly pushing a ruler off the edge of a table. And if you live on the end of the ruler, you think everything's fine, what could possibly go wrong? And then suddenly the ruler hits the floor, right? Tipping point. So, so that's a way of thinking about it. 
So let's talk about sea level rise. And uh, there's so much I could say about this, but just very recently, uh, Mr. Guterres, uh, Secretary General of the UN, said sea rise may, may rises to sea, seas may rise to what he called unthinkable levels and threaten the mass exodus of entire populations on a biblical scale. So we have to say what risks of sea level rise do we actually face? So one clue is you go back to what's called paleoclimate. So paleoclimate is the study of ancient climates millions or tens of millions of years ago. And um, our current carbon dioxide level, about 420 parts per million, actually I checked this morning, it's, it's, uh, as of this morning, it's 420.31 parts per million. Uh, our current CO2 level is comparable to what's called the Pliocene epoch, three to th three and a half million years ago. Now during that time period, of course the Earth was very different then, Global mean temperature was two to three degrees C higher than today. Sea level was 15 to 25 meters higher. I'm not talking millimeters, I'm talking meters higher. Um, CO2 level correlates fairly well with CO2, with, sorry, sea level correlates fairly well with CO2 level during the paleoclimate record. Of course, correlation is not the same as causation, but still, by this token, we have a CO2 level sufficient to take us back to Pliocene sea level conditions. But how long will it, we're dumping all this CO2 in the atmosphere, how long does it actually take for the atmosphere to come to equilibrium? Well, again, this, this is a matter of, of, of um, study and debate right now. Studies of several geological episodes have shown that large amounts of ice can melt very quickly on geological time scales, even with very small temperature shifts. So, Again, think about the, the last glaciation. So 16,000 years ago was peak glaciation. So where we are here right now is under an ice cap, probably a kilometer or two thick. Um, but it melted down very quickly for reasons that are still not fully understood. And um, uh, for a period, about 11,000 or so years ago, there, there, there was um, a period of about four or 500 years at which sea level rose several meters per century. And it would have risen in pulses because what happens is you have large ice sheets, it, then it was in the northern hemisphere, which collapse and, and they collapse. So a, a, a mass of ice can be stable for thousands and thousands of years and if it gets warm enough, it can collapse almost overnight. And um, they, they know this is very well known. So what, you, what undoubtedly happened back then is there would be um, slow, steady sea level rise with occasional pulses where it would jump up very quickly, like like, a, like tsunamis that go around the world and don't go away. And so, how much sea level rise was then? Well, back then, um, sea level was about 120 meters lower than it is now. That's not a typo. Three to four hundred feet, 120 meters. So, so. Um, so the question is, well, that's just history, but how much could sea level rise now? So if all the ice in the world were to melt, it would lead to a sea level rise today of about 65 to 70 meters. So Greenland is good for about 7 meters, Antarctica roughly 60 meters, which are estimates a little bit less certain. Uh, various mountain glaciers and ice fields around the world make up a few meters, and then there's some sea level rise due to thermal expansion because water expands when it gets warmer. So, so, um, so that's the ultimate. Uh, I don't think anybody thinks, even the most pessimistic scientists do not believe that all of that ice could melt within the near future. It's just, this is just how much is there. How much could sea level rise this century? Because remember, everything, all the bad things are gonna stop in 2100, right? We only make our projections to 2100 because, you know, uh, nothing happens after 2100. So, even very conservative estimates now have sea level rising by something like a meter by 2100, which is more than the IPCC predicts. Because the IPCC, in their calculations, were not able to take into account some of the highly nonlinear uh, methods or means by which ice, ice sheets can collapse. So this is a very active area of very active research right now. So. <clears throat> Should we plan on the basis of well-informed worst-case estimates or on the basis of possible or average estimates? Hint, an engineer must design a bridge to be strong enough to withstand the maximum load it could experience, not the average. Um, 
So basically, no scientist would disagree that in our present warming regime, sea level will inevitably rise by many meters. We're in, but the question is, how long? How quickly can this happen? Um, I'll just skip. I want to skip one slide there. I want to talk about this gentleman here, Jason Box. I've had the privilege of meeting a few times at various meetings. Um, Jason Box and a number of colleagues recently published a, a paper um, just la last September called Greenland Ice Sheet Climate Disequilibrium and Committed Sea Level Rise. And my view is this paper is game changing. It should be game changing for policy, except I just don't think people have caught on to what they, they're saying yet. So what they've done is they've essentially done, I, I mean, I do not understand all of their math, but the gist of it's very simple. They've done an assay of the amount of ice on Greenland and the amount of snow that is falling on Greenland. And it's very simple, really. I mean, if you have a great mass of ice, in order for it to be stable, the amount of snow that falls must be roughly equal to the amount of ice that's lost. Otherwise, the ice will shrink, inevitably. And at the present, in our pleasant, present climate regime, particularly in the last 15 years or so, there's not enough snow falling to keep the Greenland ice sheet in continuous existence. So, in fact, they've done the math, and there, there's a certain amount of ice that, I think a journalist coined the phrase zombie ice, dead ice walking. It's ice that still is on there, it's still on Greenland, but it's, it's not going to be replenished. It's just ultimately going to calve into the sea or melt. And they've done the math, and it amounts to about 27 plus or minus 7 centimeters of sea level rise. And the point is, we're dialed in for this. We're already there. This is not something that might happen decades from now if, if temperatures are not kept below some level. This is something we're dialed into at our present temperature levels. And, and Box's opinion himself is that the only thing that could save this ice would be some kind of rapid cooling of the Arctic and, and or some kind of massive and immediate carbon dioxide drawdown. Um, I'll have to, just for time reasons, I'll just skip global dimming even though it's very important. But I want to get to this point here. So is net zero sufficient? So current agreements focus on achieving net zero by some date conveniently in the future. Um, Canada's date is 2050. Um, because we are already at a CO2 level consistent with plus or minus 20 meters of sea level, it seems to me the obvious, an obvious elephant in the room is stopping emissions may not be good enough. Right? And this is beginning to be recognized, but even some scientists whom I very much respect still think that we can do it all with emission reductions. And um, but we may have to develop technology not only to replace fossil fuels as source of energy, but also technology that can draw down CO2 to safe levels, which would be estimated to be 350 parts per million, but possibly even less. The pre-industrial CO2 was 280 parts per million. And we have to do this very, very soon. Um, ideally, we should be drawing down, again, people have done the math, 10 to 20 gigatons of CO2 per year. But obviously that's not happening, and we, presently right now we don't have the technical means to do it. We don't know how we would do that. So, um, sorry, I'm just skipping ahead here just a little bit. Um, this is pretty much my last slide here. So implications and problems. So the philosophical message, as I said earlier, is this is not merely about us, right? The, the Thwaites Glacier, Thwaites is a very large glacier in the Amundsen Embayment that one has received a lot of attention recently, something that's called the Doomsday Glacier. It's about, I think, 12 to 14,000 kilometers due south of Lethbridge, or actually we're a little bit west of it. Um, <clears throat> it does not like all the warm water we're dumping under, and, and we live in its world. So what sh should we do now? Um, well, again, Jason Box says, carbon dioxide removal, in his phrase, has to become the project of the century. Uh, however, many scientists still downplay the need for so-called negative emissions, fearing that it will become a, a dis and I think quite legitimately feeling it will become a distraction from the hard work of switching away from fossil fuels and reducing emissions as soon as possible. So, so the kind of the narrative goes, look, um, if, if we say that, oh, 
in 2060 or somewhere, somebody's going to invent technology that will suck out all the carbon out of the atmosphere so we don't have to worry about reducing our emissions now. Then we'll only be worse off. And so many scientists are, and other people who work on climate policy are very concerned about this. But yeah, they may say, well, yeah, maybe even negative emissions would be good in principle, but, but um, uh, it, would, it would be, a, sometimes they call it a moral hazard, a distraction from the things that need to be done now. So in sum, as I see it, and I could be wrong, uh, net zero by 2050 is not a remotely sufficient climate goal. We need net negative. So CO2 or CO2 equivalent must be brought down to pre-industrial pre levels ASAP. <coughs> uh, in my opinion, carbon removal by all feasible means must start as soon as possible on a massive scale with military level spending. And uh, I published a paper to that effect, which hasn't I don't know if anybody's read it yet, but we know that major jurisdictions can afford this because they are already spending hundreds of billions on weapons. So those F-22 Raptors that shot down the balloons a couple of weeks ago developed at a cost of several hundred billion dollars. Okay. So they did a good job shooting those weather balloons down. So we should find, follow the advice of Sir David King, a British scientist who's had spoke to a lot of climate, has a, high, a climate action group, and it argues we should find ways of cooling the Arctic, especially in the summer, ASAP, possibly by means of something called cloud breaking. I, I can talk about that in the question period if anybody's interested. And I would say, just add one more thing. I think that contingency planning and preparation must be undertaken for the very bad and worst case scenarios of sea level rise. So what do we do? if and when coastal infrastructure, agricultural lands, etc., go underwater. Uh, and the U.S. Navy is pretty concerned because a lot of their major military bases are built virtually at sea level, right? Um, and very important, where are all those millions of refugees going to go? Now, here in Lethbridge, we're at about 900 meters plus altitude here, so we don't have to worry about sea level rise, we think, right? But Alberta could look like really, really good real estate for tens of millions of other people who are forced to move from wherever they currently live. So there's, there's, there, there should be some planning. There should be, what do we do if this happens? And I, I don't see much of that happening right now. Okay, um, so anyway, a few extra slides that we have time to look at, but, but, but um, but, but basically, I guess that's my point. <clears throat> Short answer is um, the, the international agreements that we have now are not remotely adequate. And um, I honestly, you know, I mean, I tend to be an optimistic and constructive person, but at the moment, I honestly don't know exactly what happens next. So, okay, with that. So we thank you. Uh to the LSCO who have provided this room free of charge, and we thank you for patronizing their uh, lunch counter. We also thank the University of Lethbridge for their ongoing support. We thank Shaw TV and Bridge City TV for recording our sessions. You can watch SACPA on Shaw Spotlight TV, or also you can log on to our website, sacpa.ca, where these talks are available on YouTube. We also thank the Lethbridge Herald for their uh, continuing uh, coverage and support. So next week's speaker will be Charles Weaselhead, who will present on what will be different at the Lethbridge shelter going forward. So we're going to have the ask, if people who want to ask questions could line up on the side here. We ask those uh, waiting to ask questions, please line up along the wall here. Please state your name and uh, your, brief, your question briefly. Uh, no long preludes or stories, please. Uh, we expect respectful. We expect respectful and polite discourse. And as I said, if you prefer to write your question, please have to me. Yeah, the questioners can come and use the mic so everybody can hear. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Thanks for that uh, talk. Who are you? Sorry we missed a bunch of slides there. My name's Tom Moffat. <laughs> um, I was just wondering, do you see any signs of, uh, instead of having uh, COP, which seems to have been taken over by oil companies lately, 
of having a cow uh, conference of the willing to get together and work on climate solutions. I, I like the phrase, but I, I haven't really heard of that. No, I mean, I mean, there's obviously many, many people around the world who are concerned about this problem, but um, this sounds like a broken record. I, I, we, we lack leadership. We, um, uh, like I say, most governments would be just happy if the problem just sort of went away if it didn't exist, and and. Um, you know, there, there's just not leadership, and, and especially in the face of, I mean, you've got, you've, you've got two intersecting forces. One is, um, in fact, the world needs energy, and, and oil still, or fossil fuels in general, still provide approximately 85% of the world's energy. And, um, you know, yes, renewables are, and are making great progress and so forth, but, and the, the first nuclear fusion reactions, I heard an interesting talk recently in the first nuclear fusion reactions. Reactors may actually be pumping power to the grid with, by perhaps 2030 or so. But, um, uh, you know, still it's, it's, it's going to have to be coal, oil, and gas keeping us going, and yet uh, it's causing all these disastrous effects. And um, nobody knows what to do about it. It's as it's, it's, it's simple as that. It's what people sometimes call a wicked problem. Uh, a wicked problem being one that you have no idea how to solve. It seems to involve conflicting requirements, and yet, which at the same time, you can't avoid solving. Yeah, Terry Shellington. Um, it's a short question, but uh, people sympathetic to the oil industry are convinced that carbon capture and storage is a very hopeful thing. Would you care to comment on? how useful and practical that concept is? Sure, I'm, I'm not technically expert on, sorry, I'm not technically expert on, on carbon capture and storage. Uh, the short version that, that I'm aware of is that the idea essentially is that you have some kind of facility such as an oil refinery that produces a great deal of CO2 and you, or let's say a, a coal-fired generating station and you somehow capture the CO2 from from the flue gas, and you can either freeze it or you can pump it underground in various ways. So what this does is it reduces slightly the, the total emissions from the the, the the generating station or whatever it may be. Um, a lot of scientists feel that uh, carbon capture and storage is not going to do the job for a number of reasons. First of all, it's not capturing very much of the carbon, tiny fraction. Secondly. If, if you have carbon capture and storage in the context of oil r removal, uh, it doesn't take into account the, the CO2 that's generated by burning all the oil you produce. Thirdly, some oil companies are actually using, what they're, they're actually using as a means to increase their oil production. So they're pumping the CO2 underground to force the last dribs and drabs of oil out of a formation. And it's not, so it, it doesn't really solve the problem. And, um, it's very expensive to implement, doesn't capture that much carbon in net. And that's the important question in net. Um, far more hopeful, I, I think, is uh, there's a sort of a new suite of technologies being developed called the DAC, direct air capture, uh, which are very, actually very hopeful. And, um, and the idea of DAC is you somehow have machinery or something that sucks in the air and you capture the carbon dioxide out of the air. There's actually several ways of doing that. And, and then the one that interests me the most is you, you um, dissolve the CO2 in water, carbonic acid, you pump it underground, and if you're in the right kind of rock formations, there are certain kinds of rock formations, particularly volcanic uh, basalts and things like that, that will literally absorb the carbon dioxide and mineralize it. And then you can recover the water for further use. Now this, in principle, could capture, again, in principle, could capture 10, 20 gigatons of carbon a year, or something like something like that, but it's going, it's going to cost hundreds of billions of dollars to set it up to scale. And uh, so far, of course, nobody's spending the money. We have money for F-22s and F-35s, and um, by the way, the F-35, um, the, the so-called Fairweather fighters, some of you may have heard of it, is, 
is uh, projected to cost $1.7 trillion in its design lifetime. Okay, so they, they're spending $1.7 trillion for an aircraft, and but it's too expensive to do anything about the climate. So, so no, sorry, I, I'm rambling a little bit. But no, carbon capture and storage, maybe it's part of a suite of solutions, but it's not, it's not the answer, and it doesn't really... Um, I mean, some people have sarcastically said it's just a form of greenwashing, but, but it, um, it, it doesn't really provide the answer as such. Klaus Jericho, uh, Ken, th thank you very much for your concise summary. Um, I'm reading a book at presently, it's called Bumblebee's Economics, and one sentence really caught my attention, that bumblebees do everything everything for survival. Now, we humans don't do that. Now, maybe half of the eight billion on this globe are doing that. But the other half, like us here, we do most of it just for our fun. To have fun. And all that fun takes a lot of energy and is totally related to what Kent explained to us. The question I have to you, Ken, how are we going to de-spoil ourselves? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I'm not sure exactly how to answer that. Um, yeah, there, there's a, there's, it seems clear that a lot of things we expend our resources on are frivolous. I mean, I just mentioned uh, military expenditures that just everybody prays will never be used. So, so um, um, I don't know if that classifies as fun, but it's, but yeah, things like NFL football. I mean, what did the Super Bowl cost in resources? You know, God knows. You know, and, and um, um, the, the interesting thing with human beings is that for us, the question of what constitutes a necessity is harder to define. So, for um, I grew up in a musical family. For a musician, um, music is about as important as food. You know, um, and yet you can say, yeah, well, you, you, you're not going to starve to death if you don't have access to music. But, but still, if, if, because of our complex neurology, the dividing line between fun and essential is a bit harder to define beyond, beyond the obvious things like adequate food and water and shelter and basic medical care and things like that. Uh, now, the, uh, now, certainly, the, broad, the broader question is a lot of people argue that we have to somehow degrow our economy. This is the problem. Just shrink our economy down to the point which we hit some level of sustainable. And um, uh, <clears throat> this is a long, a long discussion I can't get in, into properly, but I, my view is that's not good enough. I think we have to do things in different ways. And, and um, it's not just making do with less. We have to live in a different way. And I, I can't give you a pithy little expressions to what that would be, but but yeah, it certainly would make a lot of sense to examine, you know, whether we're doing, everything we do is actually needed, and uh, I mean, nobody's doing that either. I mean, is there any inventory, I mean, of do we really need NHL hockey, you know, or at least at that level, I mean, you know, I mean, okay, yeah, I'm going to get myself in a hell of a lot of trouble here, you know, so, 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 um, so, so uh, you know, it, it gets difficult, but it's, I mean, if we're going to, if we're going to get away from wasteful expenditures, I look at military expenditures first, which are absolutely colossal, and it's one of the things that makes me feel that it's still possible for us to afford massive scale remediation, such as DAC, because right now the major jurisdictions of the world are willing to spend quite literally trillions of dollars on military hardware particularly the U.S. So back in 2009, Obama gave a very fine speech arguing about the dangers of nuclear war, and then weeks later, he signed an orders authorizing the complete modernization of the U.S. nuclear triad, which will, in, when, when it's all said and done, will cost, I think, something like $2 trillion. I don't know if there's an exact price tag attached to it. There's a brand new missiles, brand new submarines, brand new bombers, Right, with all the latest equipment, so that we can blow up the world even more efficiently than we can now. So somehow they can find $2 trillion to modernize the nukes. 
and they said it's too expensive to educate children or, um, uh, you know, mediate the environment. And, and uh, if you want to look for some fun that could be removed, that would be a good place to start. Hi, my name is Kirk Peterson. As uh, someone said uh, back in the 80s or 70s, I think, uh, we can spend some money now or else we can spend a lot more later as when it comes to uh, climate change. Uh, my question relates to uh, our population nowadays, uh, all about instant gratification. And when it comes to climate change, there's no such thing. Uh, so can you talk a little bit about that? Okay, well, instant gratification. Um, I, I guess you take, you mean, there's no magic pill um, I could, anybody can provide that will just solve the problem, yeah. right? It's, it's, it's gonna take years, decades of hard work, and uh, I mean, it's like uh, Winston Churchill said at the beginning of, when he shortly after he became prime minister in, in uh, uh, May 1940, he said, I have nothing to promise but blood, toil, sweat, and tears. And um, this is gonna be really, really difficult and we may not win, you know, kind of thing. And um, I think somebody has to say that. I'm just an old professor, right? Nobody's gonna take that seriously for me, but somebody at the leadership level has to say that. And, 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 and to say, look, we can't keep putting this off. It has to be, I mean, all, all, the, all the math, all the figures that I've talked about in today show we have to start on this problem immediately. We're, we're, we're already committed to a level of sea level rise that could be utterly disastrous for the people of the world, right? We're, we're all, we've already bought into that. And that's not to, I didn't even talk about things like heat waves and extreme weather and, uh, you know, stronger cyclones and stuff. I didn't even talk, mention any of those things, right? So, so but, but um, yeah, so, some leadership is needed because people don't like bad news. So we have, but sometimes you have to present it anyway. Dave Major, thanks for your talk. Um, it seems to me that uh, the elephant in the room is a human population. And if we hadn't seen such a rapid rise in the human population, we wouldn't have climate change. So one way or another, the ultimate solution, I, I'd like to get your opinion on whether or not the ultimate solution isn't just to reduce the human population. To the manageable level, and it might happen one way or another. Well, a couple of points. That's a very good, relevant question. Um, as you said, the population might get reduced for us in ways that we would not enjoy. Right? Uh, very, you know, it could happen. Um, <clears throat> my own view is that just pointing at population by itself is, is, is um, not, it leaves a lot of things out of, out of account. And um, uh, first of all, if you, if you ask the uh, people who are expert in earth science, uh, uh, well, what level of population could the earth sustain right now if it was managed intelligently? Most of them would probably say less than eight billion, uh, but they wouldn't agree on an exact number because they don't know. Right, so this is something that needs to be further investigated. But if you if you want to look at something that could be that could be done um, in principle, at least in principle, that could be done that would make a big difference. It would be not so much reducing population; it would be um, reducing uh, changing our system of agriculture because agriculture is is it's the, the biggest single loss of cause of loss of biodiversity is cutting down forests and basically expanding into natural habitats to produce cash crops. Be, and be, I'm sorry, I'm saying this here in Alberta, uh, I've had students who've gotten really angry at me for saying this, but yeah, beef farming is very, very harmful environmentally on a very large scale. It, it, it takes an enormous amount of resources. And there are other ways we could feed people. So, so we could maybe maintain a pretty large population without necessarily having to do so much damage to the land, if we, if we care to look for those means. But it's a complicated question. 
Bev Mundell Atherstone. Thank you very much, <coughs> Kent, for coming and, and explaining things um, about this very complicated and, and dire topic to all of us. <clears throat> you talked about cloud brightening, and there have been other um, ideas put out about putting particulates mm -hmm. in the, uh, the high atmosphere to deflect the sun so that the earth would cool. Could you please explain to us a bit about those ideas? Thank you. Okay, thanks, and another very relevant question. So this comes under the general heading of what's called geoengineering, or hacking the earth system, right? Sometimes it's called that. And there's a lot of different proposals that have been looked at. Now, you mentioned the idea of, which has been studied for some years, of injecting sulfate particles into the stratosphere from aircraft. And basically what we'd be doing is emulating volcanoes. So certain kinds of volcanoes, not all, but certain kinds of volcanoes will blast large amounts of sulfate into the stratosphere and cause periods of often very significant cooling. And um, for example, Pinatubo back in 1991 caused about a half a degree, two degree cooling for about a year and a half. And, and so the idea is to put um, <clears throat> sulfates into the stratosphere. Now, it's seductively, it's enticing because it's technically feasible. It would cost something, but not that much compared to some other things, right? It could be done. Any country with a lot of airplanes and a little bit of uh, industrial capacity could do it, right? But there, there's a lot of concerns about its, its knock-on effects, that it may change the climate in ways we would not like. So it may have, again, I'm not expert, but some people believe it may have, might affect the monsoons in ways that would be extremely damaging. So, so the, this idea of solar geoengineering, there's people investigating it, trying to better understand it, but nobody's committed to doing it yet because they're scared of it. And, and I think with very good reason. Now cloud brightening is a different kind of thing entirely. And it is one that I think is a bit more Hopeful. So the idea of cloud brightening is very simple in principle. Is is you uh, you have some ships that spray water vapor into the air and then produce clouds. So you basically make artificial clouds, and which of course being clouds, they will reflect a fair bit of sunlight. And so right now somebody's exploring doing this over the Great Barrier Reef in the north of Australia, to literally to cool that area down. It's, it's only temporary. Of course, obviously it's only temporary, but that's what we're looking for here. And, and the other possibility is um, would be to do cloud brightening over the Arctic because the Arct what happens in the Arctic is incredibly important. The Arctic is currently warming, well, conservative estimates twice as fast, but more likely four or more times as fast as the rest of the globe. And this is a, having a number of, of, of effects. First of all, it's devastating the habitat and the wildlife in the Arctic, absolutely. Uh, it's changing the ways of life of, of people who are indigenous to the, to the Arctic. Um, it's, it's, it's causing more warming because as the Arctic uh, sea ice disappears, open water absorbs two to three times as much solar energy as, as ice-covered water does. So this is a case where global warming causes global warming, right? It, this is a positive feedback and, and so it's so if we could if we could cool the Arctic, it would help to cool the whole world. And um, the other concern in the Arctic, of course, is um, melting of permafrost, which again is one of the major areas of scientific uncertainty. How much permafrost could melt? How quickly could it melt? Because when it melts, uh, so land-based permafrost releases. What what happens is when it thaws out, you get biological activity building up, and then all that decaying organic matter that's been frozen solid for thousands of years gets metabolized into CO2 and methane, which are all greenhouse gases. And then there's also concern about methane on the continental shelves in, in the Arctic Sea. And that's a very large discussion that I'll take a whole other talk to, to even do justice to. But um, so, so, yeah, so, so the, 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 to, to my mind, the most hopeful use for geoengineering would be something like short-term regional effects, possibly using cloud brightening, except that they don't really have it working on that scale yet. The idea of global geoengineering using sulfate injection, yes, theoretically it might work, and we might 
be pushed to that if we're desperate enough. But nobody wants to go there. The other thing it would do apparently is turn the skies white. You'd never see blue sky again. There'd be enough of this stuff in the high atmosphere to scatter uh, sunlight. And then, um, so the, the skies would always look white, which might not be very nice. Um, you know, for those of us who like blue skies. But but um, then the other problem with the, the solar geoengineering, the sulfate injection problem, is what happens when you stop? So let's suppose we do this for a few years and, and the, the world gets used to it and we sort of get, say, you know, say it does cool things down by a degree or two and think, well, this is great. And, and then for some reason, somebody stops because it doesn't stay in the atmosphere very long, a couple of years or something at most. Then you're going to get a huge spike in warming again caused by the sort of rebound effect caused by removing the, uh, the sulfate. So, so, um, so I guess the concern is um, you prefer something that's left with fewer uh, possible side effects and, um, dare I say, more sustainable, more earth friendly. Thank you very much, Kent. Uh, my name is Jean Leclerc, and I'd just like to touch on three basic uh, ideas and uh, comment as you like. Uh, oil and corporations and the need for a paradigm shift. So first of all, uh, when I was much younger, I read a book in 1999, in fact, by an author named David Corton, who spoke about when corporations rule the world. Well, I think we're there because I think it's pretty clear to most people that uh, governments are in the back pocket of most corporations and they seem to clear, uh, steer the, uh, the initiatives and the, the narrative and to maintain everything that we have in light of the possibility of technological fixes. Uh, oil, well, I have uh, friends in the oil patch who will say, you know, well, we need these jobs, you know, I'm living this way and that's good for Alberta, et cetera, et cetera. Well, and they, and they say that basically oil cannot be replaced by photovoltaics. Well, to a certain point, they're right. And oil is a pretty freaking amazing thing if you consider that one liter of oil has enough potential manpower to displace X number of workers for three or four weeks. Well, oil is truly is gold. So I say to them, well, if, if this is really so great, why are we going through it like water? Why don't we keep it in the ground for a longer time so your kids and grandkids can have the benefit of this most precious, amazing resource? And we still have enough of it that maybe it'll last a while so that people can actually use it for what the most important things rather than making toys in China for kids to be shipped by cargo. Um, the third point is the importance of a paradigm shift that we need to make in our heads. Basically, economists seem to tell us that we, uh, the underlying message is that we have a world of infinite resources for an infinite number of human wants and needs, and that we can always meet those needs consistently and forever. Our entire economic system is based on infinite growth, which we now know is cancerous, and which we know will simply eat itself alive. So. Um, as far as a uh, change happening, I, I guess I'm part of the school of thought that would say, um, yes, things will continue to fall down um, and we're going to go to hell in a handbasket and the only thing that's really going to change is the actual force of nature that's going to make us change when that time comes. So, thanks. Okay, well you touched on a lot of things there, which I, I, I mean I can't do justice to because uh, Mark, Mark will come in wrestle me to the ground if I try, but, but, but um, uh, yeah, so, yeah, I, I guess this kind of, you know, the last thing you touched on is, is, is the big theme for me, and I mean, this, here I'm speaking as a philosopher, all right, um, and this whole question, of, you know, philosopher to worry about what is reality and all that kind of thing, and, and um, <clears throat> uh, a big part of reality is realizing that we humans are not alone in, alone in this world. Uh, we haven't been around that long, geologically speaking, and we're, we're temporarily, well, dominant, but I don't think that's even the right word. And, but, but again, there are forces in the world that are bigger than us, that have been around for a long time, and they're just gonna do what they're gonna do. I'm not claiming that they have any intentionality necessarily, but the, the ice sheets have certain requirements to stay alive. They need certain temperature regimes. 
And if they don't get those, they die. It's as simple as that. And and that's not something that we can negotiate or, um, you know, um, you know, finesse with a treaty. We can't make a treaty with the Thwaites Glacier. It's just there. It's just going to do what it's going to do. So so um, yeah. So so that's what's ultimately driving driving this whole thing is that we humans, for all our technical part ingenuity. And, and, and we are ingen very ingenious in many ways. Um, we have to wake up to the fact that we're part of something bigger and, and kind of listen to what it's telling us. And everything you said kind of, I think, consistent with that. But anyway. So I have a, a question from Rena. Are you disappointed that the uh, former environmental minister, Shannon Phillips, did not put Lethbridge on the map as the hub of renewable energy given that we have a university for research and expertise, a college for apprenticeship, training and natural resources such as Sun and Wing. Well I'm disappointed those things haven't happened <coughs> excuse me, haven't happened, but I don't entirely blame Shannon Phillips for it. There's a lot of resistance in, from many directions to these ideas. And um, uh, some of my colleagues at year at from I don't know how many years now at the university have been trying to urge the university that we could show leadership and um, there's plenty of room for a small wind farm for example on U of L property and people have actually done, done the math right it, it could produce a few megawatts like it, it, it would be significant and um, sorry I've been in many meetings about this and written letters and everything else the university is not interested, period. End of discussion. They, and they, not only if they're not interested, they don't want advice. So, so uh, and I'm just telling you, this is, I, I sound like a grumpy old professor, but it's, it's uh, you know, uh, this is sort of where it is right now. But, and there's the reasons for this are complex, and, and I don't even fully know them, because I'm not privy to those discussions. Uh, but, but, um, uh, yeah, there's a, a great deal more that Lethbridge could be doing here. And, and we have, as you say, college and university. We could be showing lead, intellectual leadership. Uh, there's been a couple of other campuses on Canada that have gone out of their way to put uh, you know, significant amounts of sustainable energy on their projects on their lands. Um, UL does not want to do that yet. And they'll tell you things, oh, well, we're not licensed to produce electrical power. Well. Okay, that's just a bureaucratic thing, and and, and uh, there's a bylaw against private wind power. You know, so so the city of Lethbridge has a thing where I think they don't want you to put a windmill on the roof of your house in case it might blow off and go through somebody else's window. Right. So and that's fair enough, but but the university is using that bylaw as an excuse that oh, the city says we can't, uh, private organizations can't have generate electricity or wind power by by wind power so there, there's a lot of work to be done and a lot of it's um, beyond my scope I mean all I can do is keep on saying what I, what little I know but uh, right now I can tell you and, and the, the current political climate does not help so so I think that probably part of the problem and nobody will really t admit this but I think part of the problem is that uh, let's imagine the, the university does suddenly um, set up some kind of very large scale sustainable energy project. Maybe they get some private funding or something. And, you know, there's a lot of ways it could be done. They're, they're terrified the UCP might just cut our, cut our funding further. Yeah. Yeah. So, so um, oh, you don't like you don't like Alberta, eh? So we'll, we'll kick you out of Alberta. Yes. Yeah, so, so I don't know. Um, it, it's they're they're, they're walking a. Uh, political minefield right now. I totally understand this. And um, they don't want to, by they I mean university administration, they don't want to do anything that is risky. So, yep. Thank you. Uh, do you have a take home message for us before we quit? <laughs> don't invest large amounts of money in seafront property? How's that? <laughs> So we hope to see you next week when uh, Charles Weasel will speak on uh, housing.
Thanks, everybody.